Hi. Welcome to Anaprime Recap. You have to survive in a post-apocalyptic world where all humans have been captured by monstrous floating heads that fly across the sky in search of their victims. We begin our dark journey through the series, Junji Ito Maniac, Japanese Tales of the Macabre. Our first story today is entitled, Ice Cream Bus. Sanahara and his son have recently moved and are still getting used to the habits of their new neighborhood. On any given afternoon, an ice cream cart drives by and begins to attract the attention of several children. The man approaches a group of mothers and asks what is going on, they answer that for a month the ice cream bus has been passing by the condo every Saturday, and it also takes all the children for a fun ride. The driver also says that this is a special way to make the children feel happy, and that everyone can enjoy a delicious ice cream while strolling around the area. On the same day, Tomoki, Sanahara's son, cries because his father didn't buy him an ice cream, the boy says that his father's food is horrible and so he would like to live with his mother. The next afternoon, the ice cream cart makes a stop at the condominium, Sanahara decides to buy an ice cream for his son as an apology and lets the boy join the ride that would take place that afternoon. Tomoki finds this amazing, he gets on the bus with several other children, and everyone has a great time all afternoon. That night, the boy comes back happy and tells his father that he had a great time, including spending the whole afternoon eating a mountain of ice cream with his friends. As the days went by, Tomoki made some friends and they all loved the Saturday outings. One night, Sanahara asks his son if he still feels like going to live with his mother, but the boy answers no, after all, the ice cream bus doesn't go there. Another Saturday arrives and the children enthusiastically get into the vehicle for the ride, Sanahara talks to the driver to get him to join in, but the man replies that adults are not allowed. A few moments before the bus leaves, Tomoki's father gets a view from inside the vehicle, he sees several children kneeling down while trying to eat two giant mountains of ice cream. This scene scares him, but he still decides not to worry. One day when he comes home from work, he realizes that his son and his friends are having fun together, when he enters the house, he finds the boy eating a mountain of ice cream, all the kids were melting into a bizarre edible substance. Tomoki tells his father that he needs to eat in order not to melt, Sanahara is startled by this and immediately tries to make his son stop ingesting the stuff, but as he does so the boy's head detaches from his body and then begins to melt like everyone else. Now let's move on to the second story, called, The Mysterious Tunnel. On a cold morning, a woman is walking with her son along the train tracks, but when she sees a tunnel, she begins to walk alone into the place. The little boy despairs when he sees his mother disappearing into the darkness. Some time has passed and Guro and his friends from high school are curious to unravel the mysteries surrounding the macabre tunnel. The group of friends go to the site with their flashlights and begin to explore the area. One of the boys knows that Guro lost his mother in that very spot, so he wishes he knew what he was hiding there. Halfway there, they are startled by some noises, until Guro tells his classmates that there is someone standing there watching them. Everyone runs from the place believing that it could be a spirit, but Guro hears a familiar voice calling him, the boy uses his flashlight and identifies that his sister Mari was lost in that tunnel and had no idea how she got there. Upon arriving home, Guro talks to his father and discovers that his little sister knows nothing about his mother's story. During the night, the boy has dreams and thoughts about the day he first walked into the tunnel. The next morning, Goro's father tells him that Mari has disappeared again, he puts on his cold clothes and goes out to look for his daughter in the middle of the blizzard, some time later the boy decides to go after his sister too, he goes back to the tunnel and enters the place alone. On the way, drops of blood fall on the boy's face, but he believes it is only water and continues on his way. On the way Guro finds his father's flashlight and believes he was close to finding him. A little further on he comes to the door of a room that was being used as a cosmic ray observatory by a university. When he opens the door, he finds his sister with some scientists. Guro informs them that he is also looking for his father, but the researchers claim that no other people have passed through the tunnel besides the two brothers, otherwise they would have noticed. Guro asks to observe the other half of the tunnel, so researcher Koyama drives around the place with the boy, but they find no sign of life. While they were alone, Guro asks what she and her group are studying. Koyama answers that it is a certain type of radiation that occurs between the earth and space, a phenomenon that passes through the human body like an x-ray. The scientist explains that this radiation is very present in the tunnel and that is why they decided to create an observatory in the same place. The next day, Guro receives a call and answers hoping it is his father, but is informed that his sister has been lured to the observatory again. The boy goes to the site and together with the researchers finds out that that place was loaded with a large amount of radiation and therefore everyone was being affected. The researcher Ishikura shows him some photos that had been taken some time ago. In the images appeared several strange beings that were all over the place, including crossing the bodies of the researchers. 
Although they do not believe in ghosts, for safety's sake, they decide to close the observatory. A few days pass and Guro receives another call. Koyama asks the boy to go to the observatory and call for reinforcement, because something surreal is happening. Upon entering the tunnel, the boy finds the old professor and Ishikura being swallowed by the walls in the floor. Their bodies pass through the structures until they disappear completely, Koyama explains that they have all been drawn back to that place against their wills. Then Mari passes by the scientist's body and quickly disappears through the tunnel walls. Guro and Koyama run to try to save their lives, but the researcher realizes that the two are being followed. As they look behind them, they come across the ghostly bodies of Mari and the two scientists on the ceiling. Ishikura's body falls on top of the researcher, and then they are both swallowed by the ground. Guro is attacked by his sister but manages to dodge, he keeps running tirelessly to find the light at the end of the tunnel, but several spirits advance towards him. Many of them pass through the boy's body, completely exhausting his strength. Guro does not resist and is also swallowed by the macabre tunnel floor. Now let's move on to the third story, entitled, The Hanging Balloons. Kazuko Morinaka is a young student who after suffering a major trauma does not even want to leave her room, living in seclusion from everyone around her. A month before, her best friend and singer Terumi Fujino left her apartment, tied a rope to the electricity wires and finally ended her life. This news shocked the whole town, as the music star always seemed to be doing well. At her funeral, many fans were present and distressed by the sad news, but only the girl's relatives and closest friends had full access to her farewell. A few days later, at the school where the girl was studying, all her friends try to understand why Terumi took her own life, while they are talking, a group of fans arrive on the scene and start threatening Shiraishi, the boyfriend of the late singer. The fans blame him for being the one primarily responsible for making her commit such a horrible act, according to them, Shiraishi never supported Terumi and always criticized her. Kazuko interrupts the fight and says that she will call the police if they assault the boy. Everyone leaves the scene, but the young man feels totally guilty about what happened to his girlfriend. Currently, Kazuko remains locked in her room, but an unknown figure with a soft voice calls her through her bedroom window at all times. Two weeks after the tragic news, Terumi's fans begin to follow her path and numerous people in the town end their own lives. On the news, a reporter reveals that a person claims to have seen Terumi's ghost wandering around the city. According to the fan, while walking through the park he came across the girl's head floating among the trees, after this, people started to divide opinions, some believe that this is all just a collective outburst due to the great tragedy. At the school where the girl was studying, the students keep arguing about the floating head issue. Kazuko feels uncomfortable with this and seeks Shiraishi's support. While talking to her friend's former boyfriend, she is surprised when the boy reveals that he saw Terumi wandering around his house, but it was only the girl's head. He tells Kazuko that he will let her know the day he sees the ghost again. The girl finds the whole thing absurd, believing that the boy was still suffering from the great loss. That same night, Kazuko receives a call from Shiraishi, he informs her of the place where Terumi's head is floating and asks her to go there immediately. Kazuko goes out in the middle of the night towards the place informed, she realizes that she is alone in a sinister place, but a few seconds later she can see her friend's head flying through the sky. The ghostly apparition enters the park and Kazuko follows it to find out its destination. As she chases after it, the girl notices that Shiraishi is standing on top of a tree, shouting in an attempt to make contact with his girlfriend. At that moment, a rope appears in the middle of the tree and hooks around the boy's neck, he loses his balance and is immediately captured. Shiraishi's floating head emerges from among the trees, but his body is still attached by a rope below the huge head. The next day, the girl tells her friends about the whole traumatic experience she had witnessed the night before, but none of the girls believe her story. While walking through the school, the group of youngsters noticed some unknown figures flying in the sky. As the objects came closer and closer they were able to identify what they really were. It was about four floating heads that had the same face as each of the girls, and a rope was tied to the heads ready to catch them. Two girls have their necks tied by ropes and are soon floating away into the sky. Kazuko and Chiharu are the only ones who manage to escape, the two friends go into an alley to try to lose the freaks. At that moment a local villager hears the cry for help and quickly decides to help them. He puts his crossbow in hand and fires an arrow at one of the creatures. The projectile hits Chiharu's floating head and the balloon begins to wither in a bizarre manner. Kazuko is relieved to see that it was only a large balloon filled with helium gas, but as she looks at her friend she realizes that her fate was similar to that of her floating head. Chiharu gets a hole in her own face and slowly her body dries up completely. Kazuko runs towards her house and realizes that the floating heads of her parents and brother are surrounding the place, she manages to get inside in time and meets all her family again. As the days passed, 
most of the townspeople were already floating in the sky hanging by ropes. The news report warns that no one should try to attack or burst the large balloons, as the same would happen to the person possessing that face. At the Morinaka family home, Kazuko's father tells everyone that he will go to work, he believes he can run to his car and thus get rid of the onslaughts of the flying freaks. His wife and children ask him not to do this, but the man replies that everything is under control. He walks out the door of his house and starts running towards his car, but in a few seconds he is caught by the rope of his floating head, and is taken to the skies like all the others. His family is terrified of the loss, but Yosuke, Kazuko's brother, tells that the food in the house is running out so he should be able to run to the market and get new supplies. He leaves his residence using an umbrella for protection. The boy's floating head comes toward him, but he throws the object where the rope was prepared to catch him, so he manages to run to the supermarket. Days pass and the boy does not return home, Kazuko's mother has no more hope and just surrenders to her own floating head, being taken to the sky already lifeless. Kazuko is the only survivor, she is trapped in her room every day desperate and confused about everything, however. One day the girl hears her brother's voice through the window, the boy says he got some supplies and survived the monstrosity's attack. The girl is delighted to hear his voice and so opens the window of her room, but as she does so, she comes across the lifeless body of Yosuke flying over the place. His floating head is the one who was talking to the girl. After this, he asks his sister to join them, the girl's head approaches the window and puts her rope on display. Kazuko expressionlessly surrenders to the terrible end. Now let's move on to the last story, called, The Strange Hikazuri Siblings. On a dark night, a group of bizarre people gather to enjoy a body being burned, everyone admires the scene, but no one says a word. Some time later, Kazuya the eldest brother of the family was resting on a bench while reflecting on the good amount of inheritance left by his parents. Every day the boy enjoyed his time alone, but that morning he came across a young woman who was walking around the outskirts of the village looking for ghosts to photograph. For this reason, she went to a river in the area, because numerous people have lost their lives by drowning in this place. Kazuya takes advantage of the situation and says that his own house is a rather strange place with a ghostly atmosphere, he invites the woman to visit the place and get some otherworldly photographs. Sachio accepts the proposal and heads with the stranger to his residence. Upon entering the place she notices a dark and terrifying atmosphere, Kazuya reveals that his parents were buried in that place and he and his siblings took care to preserve their graves. At this point the woman meets Shigeru, one of Kazuya's brothers, he has a strange and unusual personality, but Sachio is not frightened by this. The woman manages to capture several images of the residence and then leaves. That night, Kazuya has an argument with Shigeru causing Misako to cry terribly and deafeningly for her mother. Hitoshi, the quietest brother of all, as always is chosen to try to calm the little girl down. The boy approaches his sister and tries to comfort her by telling her that her parents are in heaven and that she should accept this, but Misako violently attacks Hitoshi's face with her fingernails. Kazuya must intervene and put an end to all the chaos. The older brother tells his sister that he possesses psychic powers and through this he wishes to hold a seance to invoke the spirits of his deceased parents, that way Misako could finally talk to both of them. Furthermore, the boy has in mind to invite Sachio to observe the whole ritual. That same evening, the photographer is at her house developing the photos, but is startled to realize that the house she visited earlier is surrounded by several spirits. In one of the photographs she identifies several creatures behind Hitoshi, she goes into a state of shock, but is interrupted by the sound of the doorbell in her apartment. As she looks through her magic eye she realizes that Kinako is on the other side, and the woman tells her that Sachio is invited to be an observer at a seance that will take place in her house. The photographer finds this request intriguing, so she decides to participate. The next night she goes to the Hikazuri sibling's house, but brings her boyfriend Sawano along with her, as he also has an interest in supernatural matters. Kazuya feels uncomfortable with the girl's boyfriend, but accepts his presence. He starts the seance, everyone gathers at a table, and the older brother explains that he needs to concentrate, so the others must remain silent. Meanwhile, Misako is jumping up and down and laughing with glee because she finds it all so amazing, the siblings come to a consensus again and ask Hitoshi to make the girl stop talking. The boy then asks his sister to be quiet, but Misako becomes enraged and bites his head off with all her strength. The boy runs away from the scene and goes to cry at his parents' grave. Kazuya finally begins the session and within minutes Shigeru begins to show signs of possession. His facial expression changes completely. Then a large amount of goo comes out of Shigoro's mouth. Seeing this they deduce that it might be ectoplasm and possibly take the form of a ghost. Shigeru with a different voice tells everyone that he is the father of the Hikazuri family, he reveals that Kazuya is a complete disgrace as an older brother, 
because the boy has always cheated his siblings by pretending to work. For this reason, the entity names Shigeru as the older brother. Kazuya is struck by his possessed brother and then rushes off somewhere else. Shigeru quickly returns to normal without understanding what has happened. He believes he has psychic powers, Misako on the other hand cries again for not being able to talk to her mother. The brother reveals that the ectoplasm he expelled from his body will take the form of his mother as time goes by. The little girl is happy to hear this news and collects some of that goo to await the transformation. At the end of that night, Sachio returns home with her boyfriend and both are impressed with what they saw at the siblings session. Sawano reveals that he managed to save some of the ectoplasm sample, and with that he will do some analysis at his university. Kazuya is in a rage with his father's spirit. He goes to his grave where Hitoshi was crying and throws a stone, destroying part of the tombstone. The next day, Misako was still hopeful to see the ectoplasm take the form of her mother. Meanwhile, Shigeru starts giving orders to his other siblings, asking them all to serve as the new boss. Hitoshi is ordered to massage his brother's feet, but the boy doesn't move. Shigeru loses patience and to scold him starts kicking him several times. Later, the boy announces that he wants to hold another seance and asks Kazuya to invite Sachio once again to be an observer, however he warns her not to come accompanied by her boyfriend. In his apartment, Sawano reveals to his girlfriend that he analyzed the ectoplasm and the results he got were unbelievable, because the substance was just noodles. The couple feels deceived when they realize that the whole session was a complete farce. Kazuya rings the doorbell to the photographer's apartment, but she reveals that she had already figured everything out and had no further interest in returning for a fake seance. After hearing this, the boy returns to his house in a rage and challenges Shigeru, he argues with his brother and finds out that it was all a complete staging. Kazuya hits him with a punch, but Shigeru tries to hide behind Hitoshi. The boy at that moment shows no reaction whatsoever, he just opens his mouth and releases the spirit of his father that was attached to his body. The gigantic specter takes over the room, all the siblings are frightened and run desperately out of the house. The huge entity chases the siblings to the place where his tomb was, and then enters the place where he had been buried. Hitoshi calmly walks over to his siblings and asks them why they were so scared. Which of these four stories would you make it out alive? So, what did you think of this anime? Leave it in the comments below. And if you liked the video, like it and subscribe for more anime recaps. See you next time.